Okay. So last time uh, we talked uh, about the theme of, a very important theme for this novel of perspective. We've gone back to basics. We've talked about the importance of like what perspective any story that we read is told from is important for how we interpret it. First person versus third person, those kinds of ideas. But we also saw the way in which um, perspective changes the interpretation of events in the novel, right? So, for instance, we looked at some small things like, for example, the way in which um, the, the scene in which Robbie takes off his socks and sort of goes into the Talus house, remember, initially is interpreted by Cecilia as Robbie is trying to make fun of her, right? He's trying to annoy her. And then we see later on, oh, no, actually, that's not his intention at all, right? Instead, he feels embarrassed, there's holes in his socks, they smell bad, and he sort of is like, oh, I feel, I feel like an idiot coming into this house, so I'm going to take off not just my shoes, but also my socks and come into the house, right? So those, um, those small things, right, like that, that seem kind of inconsequential, that don't seem all that important, nonetheless are clues for us as we start to see bigger misunderstandings, bigger, bigger ways of, of um, misinterpreting the events that happen between people and what they think of each other, how they behave towards each other, what happens in the novel. Um, all of these depend upon perspective. Right? So we saw, for, in for instance, one of the more serious ones perhaps is that we saw earlier on uh, Paul Marshall flirting with Lola and her flirting back, right? And remember, in the next chapter, we see Emily Tallis lying there in her bed, listening to all the noises and thinking, oh, that nice Paul Marshall, he's entertaining the twins. He's probably ignoring Lola, but he's a nice man, right? We saw how you know, that is a more dangerous misinterpretation. Right? Okay. So, um, that's what we looked at last time. Today, I want to think about some of this a theme of, uh, of the way in which the novel presents to us possible paths, possible selves, possible ways in which these characters could develop in the course of the novel. Sometimes, as in this case, we're presented with something that's um, more concrete. Right? This is from... Uh, the end of chapter three, a passage that we talked about a little bit before. And this is that strange moment in the text where we jump forward in time, right? So most of our story has been set on this one day in the summer of 1935 up until this point, but then suddenly at the end of chapter three, we suddenly jump ahead in time, six decades, 60 years, and we're told about Bryony's future. So, let me read the passage again. She says, six decades later, she would describe how at the age of 13, she had written her way through a whole history of literature, beginning with stories derived from the European tradition of folk tales through drama with simple moral intent to arrive at an impartial psychological realism, which she had discovered for herself one special morning during a heat wave in 1935. And the passage goes on a little bit more and describes, you know, uh, Bryony's career as a writer in a little more, bit more detail, right? Now, is this told to us as she might do this, or is it told to us as she will do this? She will do this. Like, this is not, I imagine maybe this will happen to Bryony. This is told to us by the novel as a fact, right? This will happen to Bryony. Six decades later, she will be a novelist. She will do this. She will have tried these styles of writing. She will have approached her work in this way. Right? So this is something that is not left to us to speculate about. We don't have to guess about it in any sort of way. We're told this as being fact in the story. However, in the, um, in the, story, in the parts of the stories involving both Robbie and Cecilia, in these early chapters, we're repeatedly presented with different possible selves that they could become, right? 
different ways in which they imagine their lives might unfold, different ways in which they think about, well, this could happen to me, or this is how I might live my life, this is how I imagine myself being in 20 years' time or 50 years' time or whatever, right? So notice that there's this difference. Bryony's future is presented to us as absolute fact, right? She will become this novelist. She will try these styles. She will do these things. Fact. Here, this one, this is from our previous reading, right, from chapter 8, in which Robbie himself is speculating about his own future. And remember, he's just finished his, um, his degree at Cambridge. He's been studying English literature. He's very successful. He got a first. And now he's decided, all right, I'm going to, uh, I've decided I want to be not a gardener, not a writer, not a professor of literature, but a doctor, all right? So as he's there, he thinks about what he will be like in the future. Um, and he says to himself, he thought of himself in 1962 at 50, right? Remembering that he's 23 now, right? So he's, oh, this is more than double my age, he's thinking. At 50, when he will be old, but not quite old enough to be useless. <laughs> right? And of the weathered, knowing doctor he will be by then, with the secret stories, the tragedies, and successes stacked behind him. Broad tolerance and the long view and inconspicuously warm heart and cool judgment, his kind of doctor would be alive to the monstrous patterns of fate and to the vain and comic denial of the inevitable. He would press the enfeebled pulse, hear the expiring breath, feel the fevered hand begin to cool and reflect in the manner that only literature and religion teach on the puniness and nobility of mankind, right? So here, does this happen to Robbie? Does it say it will happen to him? No, it doesn't, right? This is him in the bath imagining what his future will be, right? He's speculating, he's imagining, he's thinking about these different possible selves, these different possible paths through his life that he might take, that he's expecting that he will take, that he will go through in the future. Right. So um, there is, as I said, this important difference in the way in which McEwen presents to us these two different futures. One is presented to us as definite fact. The other is presented to us as possible future, speculation. This might happen. Right? This is what he is expecting, what he's hoping to happen. Right? Kind of one of the funny things about, or one of the amusing things about uh, Robbie's vision of the kind of doctor he will be is that it is very, very similar to the, um, the Russian, famous Russian short story writer Anton Chekhov. Chekhov was both a famous short story writer and a doctor. Right? And so <laughs> his, his vision is almost exactly like what uh, Chekhov was like. Anyway. Um, this next quote here is from a series of quotes, right, a series of examples um, that happened early in our reading for today, right? And in this part of the chapter is where, remember, the, um, uh, the return of Leon, right, to the family home, the older brother, means that they're going to sort of throw a little um, get-together, right? So it's going to be Leon, it's going to be Paul Marshall, it's going to be Cecilia, and they've also invited Robbie to come join them, right? So they're sort of having a family meal, and also they are going to sort of have a, a young adult get together as well um, a, that evening, right? We know it's beautiful weather. We know it's summertime. We know it's very, you know, sort of relaxed atmosphere, except for the tension between Cecilia and Robbie, right? Now, in this, in this context, right, this is where we see Cecilia trying on her different dresses. Right? So this is the scene I want to sort of um, study and analyze a little bit. What's happening here? Right? Well, just like we saw Robbie speculating about his future, what his self might look like 
right? Remember, he talks, thinks about 1955, he thinks about 1962, right? When he's, you know, 20 years from now, and then when I'm 50, he's imagining what he will be like as this elderly doctor, right? So too, we get some different glimpses of Cecilia when she tries on different clothes in the mirror. So she's standing there in front of the mirror. And what color is the first dress that she tries on? Black, right? And she tries on this black dress with what color shoes? Black. With what color necklace? Black. Right? Everything about it is black. Right. So she puts on these clothes. Right? She thinks for a moment she might go with a pearl necklace instead of the black, but no, she goes with the, the jet black. And she then goes to the mirror, and this is what she sees. But the public gaze of the stairway mirror, as she hurried toward it, revealed a woman on her way to a funeral. <laughs> right? Because, of course, you know, people wear black to, uh, to funerals in Britain. Um, an austere, joyless woman, moreover, whose black carapace had affinities with some form of matchbox-dwelling insect. Right? So the, the way her dress hangs on her, she said, look, makes her look like an insect. The carapace is like, you know, when you see an insect and it sort of has like little sections on its stomach, right? And they, they're usually quite relatively hard, right? So that sort of a, like an armor, right? To protect their, their insides. Well, this is how she imagines this um, this dress makes her look. It makes her, first of all, feels like she's an insect, and then it's like this is sort of her insect armor. That's how she's imagining it. So not, not a very appealing thing. And on top of it, she feels like, oh, I look like I'm going to a funeral, not to a fun get-together, right? A stag beetle, right, is how she imagines it. It was her future self, 85, in widow's weeds, right? So, you know, there's a, a long tradition that, um, I mean, people don't do it so much anymore, but there's a long tradition that when um, a woman's husband died, that she, un unless she remarried, she might wear black you know, the rest of her life in mourning for her dead husband. Um, or even, not even necessarily for the rest of her life, but certainly often traditionally for a specified period of time you wore that, right? you wore black. She did not linger. She turned on her heel, which was also black, and returned to her room. Right? So notice what it says about her, why she is um, disturbed by this vision. First of all, it, it's, she can see that the dress itself doesn't seem to be very flattering. It makes her look old. It makes her look depressed. It makes her look like she's going to a funeral. All those things she's not so happy about. But also, look at the, um, the words that McEwen uses. It was her future self, right? So her future self. And she looks at, in this mirror and she's like, I don't want to be that person, right? That's not me. I'm still young. I'm 23. I just graduated from Cambridge. You know, I'm, I'm, um, I'm you know, lively and young and have my life ahead of me. I don't want to feel like I'm some mourning, depressed, you know, unhappy widow, right? And so, of course, the solution to this is that the, the uh, feeling that she is this way is caused by the dress, so she decides, oh, no, not this dress, right? So in this case, it's the dress, it's the outer garments that create this feeling, this impression of her future self. Right. And we see that Cecilia has this sense that, you know, the way in which she dresses is going to determine her mood, her feelings during that evening, right? And she sort of, um, we have this uh, part here on page 51 where she s says she runs, she ran her hand along the few feet 
of personal history, her brief chronicle of taste. In other words, she sort of runs her head along the, you know, the shirts and the dresses and the skirts and everything that she owns in her, in her wardrobe. And she's sort of like, oh, this is sort of like my history, right? This is the clothes that I used to wear and that I now wear and maybe that I will wear when I feel like an old widow, right? But like, this is sort of a, a, a history of where she's been, but also we can see that this moment of choosing is she's thinking about, this is about what her future, what she's going to create out of her future. Right. What's the next color she chooses? Pink, all right. And the pink, remember, she's looking for something that will show her her future. This, unfortunately, this pink one also does not work. Let's see why. Even as she approached from a distance of 40 feet, right? So remember, the mirror is not in her room. She has to go out into the hallway to, to look in the full-length mirror, right, to see what she looks like. Um, even as she approached from a distance of 40 feet, she, thought, she saw that it was not going to let her pass. The pink was, in fact, innocently pale. The waistline was too high. The dress flared. Oops like an eight-year-old's party frock. All it needed was rabbit buttons, right? As she drew nearer, an irregularity in the surface of the ancient glass foreshortened her image, and she confronted the child of 15 years before. Right? Remember, it says the dress makes her look like she's eight years old. So 15 years before, remember, she's 23 now. That would be when she was eight. She stopped and experimentally raised her hands to the side of her head and gripped her hair in bunches. Right? This is because, um, you know, in, I, don't, I don't know about in Korea so much, but when little girls pull their hair into, into two bunches like that, pigtails, they're called, really only little girls usually do that. Right? If, you're, if you do that in, as an adult, it sort of looks like you're trying to look like you're, like you're a little girl. All right. So it's not usually very fashionable to do that. Um, so it's a style for, for little girls to, to, called pigtails. Right? You, just, you pull your long hair into two sort of little tails. Like that. Or sometimes up here like that. OK. Um, this same mirror must have seen her descend the stairs like this on dozens of occasions. Right? So, this is, some, this is a self that she's been before. The mirror has seen her pass in this same guise, in this same dress, before in this way. Um, on dozens of occasions, on her way to, some, uh, to, to one more friend's afternoon birthday bash, bash is slang for a party. Um, it would not help her state of mind to go down looking like or believing she looked like Shirley Temple, whom you can see uh, there, that's Shirley Temple. She's a famous child actress um, whose peak of her fame was uh, right around this time that the, the story is set. So in the sort of rose to fame in the early 1930s, sort of peak of her fame around 1935 to 38, and then as she started to uh, um, become an adult, she sort of lost her appeal and she eventually um, gave up acting. She actually only, only died very recently. Um, you might have heard about that. Right? So here she is. She's sort of this, this icon for um, sort of precocious childhood. Right? She, was, she was good at dancing. She was good at singing. Um, and she was, for her age, was very sort of advanced and, um, and very sort of self-confident. And I guess this, for whatever reason, had a great deal of appeal um, in 1930s movies, right? So, um, yeah, this is Cecilia saying, all right, I know I've dressed this way lots of times before, but, yep, that is also not me, right? That was the me of 15 years ago. That was my past self. I've been that person. That's not me anymore either, right? So we see here, Whereas Robbie just looks forward to the future for the most part, although he does contemplate a little bit about his, his past and you know, his, his family history and so on 
for the most part, he's looking to the future. He's looking to when he'll be a doctor, he'll have this successful career. Cecilia, she needs more time because as we've seen, she is more conflicted as a character about what she's going to do with her life, right? Remember the, the metaphor that we saw in the first couple of chapters was that of order and disorder. Bryony childishly wants to force her order upon the world. She thinks everything should be just so, exactly how she wants it. Whereas Cecilia, by contrast, she feels like even though she's just graduated from university, her life is sort of in chaos. She doesn't know what she's going to do next. It's one of the reasons why she returns home to her family during that summer, is that she's sort of like, well, what am I going to do next? Am I going to get a job? Am I going to study more? What am I going to do? What's going to be my next step? I have no idea. So, she doesn't want to, uh, she doesn't want either the, this horrible vision of this widow, insect widow from the future, and she certainly doesn't want to um, appear like a, a little girl. So, we find instead that she has this one outfit that immediately after these first two failures springs to mind. She's like, ah, oh, of course. There's what I know exactly the outfit that I have in my wardrobe. It's the one that I want to wear. It is the one that I've only sort of just grown into, right? I've only just sort of been able to be adult and grown up enough and had the body to be able to wear this gown. And I also now feel like I'm starting to have the right attitude, right? And you need a bit of, you know, um, pride and you know, attitude to wear this dress. And so she's starting to think, all right, now I, can, now I can wear this, right? I can wear this dress that I have in mind. So here she talks about it. She says, she owned only uh, one outfit that she genuinely liked, and that was the one she, would wear, she should wear. She let the pink dress fall on top of the black, right? So notice that the, both the past and that future sort of crumple together and are discarded symbolically, and stepping contemptuously through the pile, reached for the gown, her green backless post-finals gown, right? So post-finals here means like she's just finished her university exams, and this is her gown that she has bought. As she pulled it on, she approved of the firm caress of the bias cut through the silk of her petticoat, and she felt sleekly impregnable slippery and secure. It was a mermaid who rose to meet her in her own full-length mirror. Right. So here, she tries on this dress, and she can feel that it fits perfectly. It's the, it's the person that she was supposed to become and that she is aspiring to become by wearing this dress. That's what it symbolizes. Right. We could also see in the green, Right? Talked about seasons and spring and stuff like that before. And of course, spring is a green season where we have new beginnings, new shoots, new openings, new beginnings. Right? And we see this possible symbolism as well. All right? So I want to draw a parallel here between this important scene where Cecilia is trying to work out what kind of clothing that she is wearing to the earlier scene where we first meet her. And what is, she, what is she doing in that first scene where we meet her in chapter two? What is the task that she's been given by the family to do? The flowers, right? Remember, she's been asked to put the wildflowers in the guest bedroom for, for Paul Marshall, right? And remember, we've talked about the symbolism of that scene where, remember, she, she, does she get the, the flowers right the first time? No, right? She has to try several times to get the arrangement right, and even then, it involves the whole scene um, by the fountain, right? right? That's what leads to the fountain scene. So 
if we look at this carefully, we can see that there is a parallel between the uh, flower arranging, right, and this scene, these, the scene, the three attempts to get on the right dress, right? So the first one is trying to show the beauty of the wildflowers, right? And it's trying to arrange them in this order that looks natural, but as we talked about, is actually an artificial order, right? Even though it's supposed to sort of look like the flowers have just fallen into the vase naturally, they're specially arranged that way. In the same way, when we look at Cecilia, what is she doing? She's trying to highlight her natural beauty. She's trying to highlight who she is. She's trying to bring out her own character and highlight you know, what she looks like through her clothing, right? to express herself in this particular way. So just as she arranges the wildflowers, no, I didn't get that right, no, 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 let me try that again, no. Still not right. Let me take this out to the, to the fountain and see if I can arrange the flowers correctly there. All right? So to, oh, try on black dress. Oh, no, that doesn't look right. I'll try on this pink dress. Oh, definitely not. All right? Oh, I know, the green dress. Perfect. All right? And so, of course, all of this is carefully arrange the, the, the dress is cut, she has the makeup on, she's done her hair, right? All to bring out this beauty of hers that is both something that is natural but also that she's had to arrange, right? So it's artificial in that sense. Okay. So notice too that both times that this occurs, at the end of this process, at the end of the fountain scene, right? Remember the fountain itself has these classical references built in because of the, the god Triton and his, uh, his mermaids and stuff that are, are borrowed from the fountain in Rome, right? He's this Greek god. And then when um, uh, Cecilia emerges from the fountain, she's compared to a nymph, right? Which remember we, we said the, the Greeks and the Romans not only had the, the big famous gods with the, all the names, but they also had for trees and rivers and fountains and so on, they had little local gods, right? And um, Cecilia is called a, a frail white nymph in that particular scene. In the scene with the, um, the green dress, rather than a nymph, we're given a different myth mythical reference. She's referred to as being like, a mermaid, right? So there are these mythical references as well that get tied to this creation, this addition to, um, to, to nature of this kind of female beauty. Okay. Now, these scenes um, obviously, they reflect primarily upon the, um, the character, the specific character of Cecilia. But um, McEwen is also doing something else here. Remember, we've, we've talked about the importance of the setting in 1935, right? It's, it's during the rise of you know, Hitler, right? Hitler has come to power in Germany. It's just before World War II. Right? We've seen that there's a sort of uh, a push, it seems, by some people for war. And we can see this in the comments of Paul Marshall. Right? Um, although Mr. Tallis, the father, doesn't seem to think that there will be a war, but others do. Um, and, and of course, we know historically that there was a war, so we know what's going to happen in that sort of sense. But there's also other things going on in this context that have to do with gender, right? That have to do with the position of women in Great Britain during this time. So I think I mentioned in a previous class that, you know, 1935, women had only had the vote, for example, the ability to vote in elections in Great Britain for seven years at that point, so in 1928, was when women were first granted the right 
to vote. And even though, you know, um, Cecilia doesn't always talk about this or think about this directly, there are certain moments that McEwen gives us clues as to how she feels torn about the different possible paths and roles that she could have as a woman, right? So um, one example we see of this is that, remember, 1935 is when this is set. When she's flicking through, that scene where she's flicking through her wardrobe and thinking after she's tried on the black dress and she doesn't, doesn't like it and she's looking for something else to wear, right? And she looks through all the different clothes that she has. And she remembers the clothes that she used to wear in the 1920s. In this case, it says here, here were the flapper dresses of her teenager years. Ludicrous, limp, sexless things they look now. And though one bore wine stains and another a burn hole from her first cigarette, she could not bring herself to turn them out. Right. So here, these, these particular dresses, there's this particular reference to something called a, a flapper. And here's a picture to help you sort of have an idea. This is the famous actress, Louise Brooks, famous Hollywood actress. And these are some other random flappers from that time. And the idea behind the flapper was that they were kind of more sort of a forward-thinking, independent woman, right? They were less in the mold of the sort of the ladylike you know, stereotype of the Victorian woman of the 19th century. Right? And instead, were much freer, much more open. Right? So this means sort of more open sexually, more open in their behavior, more open in their uh, political ideas. Right? Um, and this would be uh, illustrated, as you can see in the, the quote that I just read out about Cecilia's, the damage to Cecilia's dress comes from her doing what? What has she been doing that's caused damage to these dresses? Smoking and, and drinking, right? Now, remember, you know, for, for us today, it might not seem such a big deal, right? We see women drinking, smoking all the time. But in that repressive Victorian period, right, Ladies sometimes smoked, women sometimes smoked, but they had to do it in private. They were allowed to drink maybe, but they're expected to do it out of sight. Right? Whereas the flappers, they were like, oh, I'm not interested in that. I'm going to go out to the bar. I'm going to drink as much as I want. I'll sleep with who I want. I'll smoke cigarettes in public if I want. Right? So they're this much more open, much more affirmative kind of woman that starts to emerge in the 1920s, right? And this is in turn reflected, um, as you can see, in their styles, right? By our standards, not all that, you know, not all that uh, um, revealing or, or shocking. But, I mean, remember, the Victorians had very strict, tend to have very strict dress standards. So here, I mean, we can see their legs. Oh my God, look at that. And these bare arms. Oh, it's pornographic, basically. Right? So the, the flapper period, the 1920s, was seen as a, a much more open, and they're also a much more prosperous decade right, than the 1930s. Remember, the 1930s is during the, the Great Depression. So the picture that we're getting here of the Talis family is this fairly rich and privileged family is an unusual one during this time. This is a time of lots of unemployment, lots of you know, pain and suffering and, and difficult times economically. Right? So she's looking back at this other past self, the flapper period that she went through when she was a teenager, when she was a bit more rebellious and you know, she was smoking and she was drinking and she was out there having some fun. Right? Obviously she was not as sexually open as some of the the stereotypes of the flappers, because we, we know that she hasn't uh, um, seen many men. 
Now, this next quote comes to us from chapter six, and that was the one where we saw the thoughts of Emily Tallis, right? And the sense that we get of Emily Tallis is that she's a very conservative, old-fashioned stereotype of a woman, right? And she does not share the same generational values as Cecilia, right? So she's much more of a throwback to that Victorian stereotype or that Victorian type, okay? Much more oppressed, thinks that women belong at home, that their goal is to get married, and if they do go to university, they go to university to find a husband, right? That's her, that's her position. And so um, in this time period, the, the women who are teaching at the university in particular are seen as kind of radicals, right? They want women to be equal and to vote and to have all sorts of rights that they didn't have. So McEwen gives us a fairly sort of um, sarcastic uh, view of um, what Emily thinks of Cecilia. It says, when Cecilia came home in July with her finals result, the nerve of the girl to be disappointed with it. She's like, yeah, she got a degree. Why does she care if she got a third, right, instead of a first? like Robbie. She had no job or skill and still had a husband to find and motherhood to confront. And what would her blue stocking teachers, the ones with silly nicknames and fearsome reputations, have to tell her about that? Those self-important women gained local immortality for the blandest, the most timid of eccentricities, walking a cat on a dog's lead, riding about on a man's bike, being seen with a sandwich in the street. Oh, shocking. A woman eating in the street. That's almost as bad as one smoking in the street. Right? A generation later, these silly, ignorant ladies will be long dead and still revered at high table and spoken of in lowered voices. Right? Remember, this is Emily's perspective. Not McEwen's, Emily's perspective. Right? This word here that she uses, blue stocking, is this period's and the 19th century's period, uh, period's um, equivalent of a feminist, right? A derogatory term for a feminist, though, right? It came out of a, 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 a literary intellectual club that was formed by a group of women in the, in the 18th century, in the 1750s, right? And they were interested in literature and sort of had an intellectual bent, and then gradually it became a term that was associated with um, feminism, with, uh, with women who didn't get married, too radical for that, and who wanted women's rights and so on. So it becomes a kind of insulting term um, by this point, right? And so, she's, so here Emily is sort of um, saying about her daughter, she's like, oh, my daughter, you know, she spent all this time at Cambridge, she didn't even find a husband, she didn't get a good, she didn't, she didn't get a, a degree where she's going to get a job, right? And she's, she thinks she has all these like feminist ideas, crammed into her head by all these professors, and who's going to care about these professors in the future? Feminism is just something that will be seen as um, something that was a, a, a short, strange thing, and then has gone and died out, right? Again, McEwen is being kind of sarcastic here, because we know that, of course, that feminism has gone on to do lots of other more important things in the, in later on in the future, all right? So, Notice that there are these, there's this sort of, this historical tension for Cecilia. On the one hand, there's the 20s, there's the flapper movement, there's this new openness for women. There's the feminism that comes out of the Cambridge environment that she is influenced by, right? These women around her. Remember earlier on, we see um, Cecilia smoking, right? And we're told that most of the time she's very forward about, like, you know, I smoke, I'm a woman, I can do it in public if I want, except there's a one person she won't smoke in front of. Who's that? Her father. She's still worried about what he'll think. Right? So you can see there's these two opposite tensions pulling at Cecilia and her future and her possible selves. Right? Does she follow this tendency that she followed 
through her teenage years with her flapper, dressing as a flapper, through her period at Cambridge where she was influenced by these feminist teachers who told her, you know, women can do anything, they can vote, they can have jobs, they can, you know, be anything that they want to be. Or does she listen to her mother and her father who are conservative and who are telling her, no, a woman's job, get married, have children. This feminism stuff, all this, this nonsense will go away, right? Never last. Right? It's just a few weirdos who are, who are interested in this stuff, right? And so Cecilia is pulled in these two different directions by, um, by these, this changing historical period and the way in which opportunities and ideas and expectations for women are changing at this time. All right, I want to, since we need to have some time for class discussion, I want to just quickly, um, oh, by the way, this is some of the, <laughs> you can see here, the, the blue stockings, they're the earliest sort of manifestation of this, that the, the literary club, and then it becomes a sort of insult term for, uh, for feminists. And then we have the suffragettes, right? Suffrage does not have anything to do with suffering, right? Doesn't have anything to do with pain. It means the right to vote, right? So if you, if you have universal suffrage, it means everyone can vote. If you have male suffrage, it means only men can vote, right? So, um, and then, of course, the more modern, recent term for it has become feminism, right? Um, I want to quickly mention a couple of other small points. When the moment after... Um, the moment after uh, Cecilia has tried on all her dresses, remember there's a sound at the door, and she goes and opens the door, and she says there's a Picasso-like perspective of the two upset twins. Of, this is the top of page 52 in our course packet. And this is because, first of all, to explain this little reference here, she sees the twins, right? So she sees two, two crying faces in front of her that look exactly the same, right? And then she's like, whoa, this is sort of like a Picasso painting. And what you can see here is this is Picasso. He, he did a number of paintings like this all through his, um, his career, right? And what he was trying to do was he was trying to represent three dimensions, but on a two-dimensional canvas, right? Because, you know, you can only show two dimensions on a painting, right? You can't have painting in 3D, right? So um, what he would do was he, partly inspired by some uh, African art that he had seen, African tribal masks, um, he would paint the side of the face that we could normally see, like you know, if we were looking at the woman's face from side on, and then to show the perspectives, to show the sort of the 3D effect, to show the other side of it, he would paint the other side of her face that normally we couldn't see, like looking from side on. If you can imagine, if he was to paint my, the other side of my face facing this way, so that you could see all my face, but obviously it would not be truly 3D but to try and give this impression, oh, this is a sort of a three, I want you to think about the three-dimensional nature. I want you to think about the things that you can't see in two dimensions, right? So again, remember this, this uh, the reason I mentioned this is both to explain the reference here, but also because it ties in with our, um, our important discussion of perspective in this novel, right? Even in painting, these modernist authors, uh, modernist painters rather, are exploring the possibilities of how do you represent things? How do you present this kind of perspective? How do you present something like three dimensions in two dimensions, right? How do you write this story? And it's something that we see the narrator struggling with. Do I, you know, 
Why do I, how do I write this? Okay. And then lastly, just to, uh, just to conclude, I want you, as you're reading the next, um, the next section, the, the next, next little parts, next few parts, to pay close attention to one of the, a key metaphor, that of light. Light, right? Light, light and, well, the contrast between light and darkness, right? So, in particular, I want to think about this scene that comes from uh, chapter 7. Um, it's on page uh, uh, 49 in the course packet. And this is the scene where um, Ravi gives Bryony the letter, right? And look very carefully, watch very carefully at how um, McEwen describes the ability to see things and darkness and light and how it affects his perception of what is happening, right? His footsteps quickened in the still summer evening to the rhythm of his exultant thoughts. Ahead of him, about a hundred yards away was the bridge, and on it, he thought, picked out against the darkness of the road was a white shape. It's like, I can't make, what is this? Like, remember, it's evening, it's, it's getting dark, like it's not quite nightfall, but it's getting dark, and all he can see is this white shape, which seemed at first to be part of the pale stone of the parapet. Staring at it dissolved its outlines, but within a few paces, it had taken on a vaguely human form. So at first he's like, is that a rock? Is that part of the, what is that? And then he's like, oh, it looks like it has a human form, right? Because remember, it's getting dark. It's hard to, hard to see. At this distance, he was not able to tell whether it faced away or toward him. It was motionless, and he assumed he was being watched. He tried for a second or two to entertain himself with the idea of a ghost, but he had no belief in the supernatural, not even in the supremely undemanding being that presided over the Norman church in the village. It was a child he saw now, right? So he's looking at this, like, what is this? Is it a rock? No, it seems to have a human form. Is it a ghost? Is it a statue? What is it? Oh, it's a child he saw now, and therefore it must be Bryony in the white dress he had seen her wearing earlier in the day. He could see her clearly now, so we can, obviously he's getting closer and closer and closer to her, right? And he raised his hand and called out to her and said, it's me, Robbie, but still she did not move, right? So this is important for what will happen later on, but also because it sets up for us, again, we, we saw how knowledge, knowing about things, is going to be crucial when we think about perspectives, interpretations of events, and light and dark also influence the way in which we see things too, right? So this, uh, I can skip the next quote, I think, um, but the, uh, the, this question of light and darkness keeps coming up in the course of the story. It keeps being used by McEwen as a symbol, and that's because light has a long-standing status, just like the seasons and some of those other symbols that we've talked about. It has a long-standing status in literature as a symbol of things like knowledge, insight, wisdom, rationality. Why? Because light allows us to see things, right? Allows us to be able to see things clearly, right? Whereas, of course, darkness, you know, tends to be stand for the opposite of that, right? It tends to stand for, if we have knowledge, it tends to stand for ignorance, right? If we see wisdom as being light, then darkness tends to show us folly or foolishness, right? So this is going to be an important symbol or metaphor that is used in the rest of our, our story as we go along. So. Um, he uses, McEwen, pay close attention, please, as you're, as you're reading the next few chapters, and, and pay close attention to how McEwen uses light, darkness, right, and plays back and forth between those two symbols of knowledge and, um, and wisdom and 
folly and uh, ignorance. Okay. So let's turn now to our, um, our homework sheets and let's see uh, what were some of the important parts that you guys picked out. I know I've talked about the Cecilia changing her dress, but there's lots of other stuff that is talked about in here. Um, so let's see what are some of the parts that you picked out as being crucial for discussion. Okay. All right, we're out of time. So thank you guys. Those of you who, who didn't get to speak today, I'll catch up with you next time. Um, also next time, um, we have to do this. Uh, even though you'll notice like the camera is always focusing on me and talking uh, and, and focusing on me talking, it doesn't like ever go in like, John Min, what is this thing? Um, I do have to have uh, permission slips from all you guys. So just to say, oh, you know, this is allowed to be filmed, right? So don't worry, you're not going to be filmed, you're not going to be in it, it's all on me, I'm the star, it's, it's all about me, right? But, um, but I do need the permission slips from you, so I'll, I'll hand that out next time, if you could just sign off on that. Thank you guys. <laughs>